closing the door of your flat, and close it again behind you. You feel almost as if you were sleepwalking. Suddenly, everything you worked on over the recent months goes falling in roads around you, as if only a dream. The bearish and inversion of events have honestly been accepted as official truth, to the extent that even you have begun to doubt yourself. In addition to this crushing self-doubt you feel, the weight of a strong, violent, invisible threat at the back of your mind. You are holding your hands and notes in which you place so much trust. The realness and solidity is the only thing showing that you have not lost your mind in a match the last few months. And yet, what good have they done? You fling the crowds in rage. Perhaps you're not mad, but paranoid. Is what you're feeling now only anger and frustration? Or is this threat real? Oh, it's real. It's in this state of self-doubt, you resolve that the first priority should be to minimize the risk to reverse consequences for Reginald. After everything is done for you, you cannot risk his losing his career, perhaps even his life. You decide to go to the Hog to warn him and try and persuade him to go back to the safety of London. Jake, what a nice surprise. Imagine you've joined me here to celebrate the publication if you work with Bergenick. Go for your beer together, then you tell him everything that has been happening and your suspicions. Then you tell him your fear that you may be suffering from paranoia. I wouldn't call it paranoia. It just sounds like caution to me. I won't complain about leaving these Dutch snobs getting back to the comfort of London. Besides, they are completely clueless about meat pies. Don't you worry, I'll be in London before you have time to put the belly back on. Reginald laughs heartedly. All right, old boy, I don't mind admitting that I'm looking forward to being back in England. You embrace your friend and then accompany him, accompany him to the ticket office. Only once you've seen him with the ticket in his hand, walk up the gangway of the boat, you turn back to the flat. Perhaps you'd be doing exactly the same thing as Reginald, getting back to London. After all, Delta's has nothing left to offer you. You are reflecting, wondering whether it is really worth it to insist on your share of the credit for your discoveries of Bergenic. Is it really time to make your decision it's with your pride? It's not about pride. It's about the fact that there's something going on suspiciously. Furthermore, if your best chance to lie in proving your case, the academic sphere would not make more sense to try again in an environment where you still have some reputation. That is to say, in London. You no longer have any responsibilities or ties here. Immediately start packing your belongings and the few things that Reginald has not taken with him to the hog. Your funds are extremely low. You have been counting on at least some level of economic compensation for your research. It will take a few days to organize a cheap ship to London. Possibly even a cargo ship. Since this time you are by yourself. You're busy finishing packing your bags, but you cannot get these paranoid thoughts out of your mind. Even without definite evidence to back up your suspicions, you cannot help but feel tangled up in a web of conspiracy. Procedure. You only need to go back to the basics of procedure. The only remedy for the physical and mental chaos the last few days is to return to the discipline of your military training Logic evaluate your best course of action. You will return to London. Given the uncertainty of your situation and the possible risks, you should try to identify the people watching you and throw them off your trail. And if it turns out that no one is watching you, you at least have taken all due precautions. In spite of everything, this disciplined thinking seems to momentarily calm your nerves. Just need to focus. Close the last bag, someone knocks at the door. Approach the door, but you don't open it immediately. You ask who it is, and a voice with a heavy North African accent claims to be a messenger. Let's open the door. Cautiously open the door just enough to see who is there, but not so much just to expose itself to any risk. Waiting, there's a black man with a scarred face, wearing a robe which looks much too small for him. 
He hands you a note. Best for Mr. Huntington. You take the note from the hands of the man who looks at you with a slightly idiotic smile. You thank him and he nods. For a second, you seem to catch a strange twinkle in the man's eyes. It's over an instant, and it may have only been the light or imagination playing tricks on you. Right away, you sit down and begin reading the unexpected message. Jake, this is the second time I'm writing to advise you. I hope the fil- fulfillment of the predictions of my first message is convinced you of my good intentions. You do not know me, Jake, but I am a friend. The time has come to warn you. Share all involuntarily. You had completely forgotten the mysterious message she received in Zanzibar. Yeah, I definitely have forgotten completely. I don't remember this at all. I can imagine that you've already started noticing strange things happening around you. And you must have many suspicions. I can confirm you na- for you now that these are indeed justified and that you have attracted the attentions of a very powerful and very secret cult. This cult counts among its members, captains of industries, nobles, politicians, many other types of powerful people, and they only have one objective, total control. They have different ways of gaining it, but there is a plan that they have been pursuing for a very long time. A plan that involves the disease. Epidemics are of their main weapons, and so you have assumed a key role in your eye, in their eyes. You must be ready to defend yourselves. Signed, a friend. You reread the message twice. You are quite certain that this is no joke, but can you really put your trust in this friend? In light of the latest development, the idea of returning to London is even more attractive. Hmm. I mean, it's far fetched, but he's right about a lot. Well, consider it trusting, but we'll be careful. You will carry out your plan as you already decided, but because of this latest warning, you think it is advisable to procure a pistol. Fair. Do you remember having a gun shop on your wanderings around Delft? In the end, you find it, but quite a bit further away than you remembered it. Shopkeeper welcomes you with a smile. So you tell him that you are looking for a small, easily concealable pistol. Shows you various models, but one of them immediately stands out as what you were looking for. You buy it and leave. I have 94 experience. If I ever need to use it, I can add experience. Everything is ready. You need only leave your flat, head to the port, board your ship, and you will be on your way home. About to leave the flat, you hear footsteps on the stairs outside. Stop right outside your door. You pull out the gun and hold it ready. Dr. Huntington, we must talk with you. They do not even knock. They know full well that you are in and that you can hear them. You're frozen on the spot, waiting. After a strange moment of silence, Doris finally kicked down three men burst in. Point the pistol in the direction, wait. Three men burst to the room, but they instantly freeze. They see the pistol in your hand. Dr. Huntington, I think you are mistaken. I really don't think so. What do you want to do? Leave? Or escape? Plus threat. Let's do one more speech craft. I don't know who you are, what you want, but I want you out now. Please believe me, Dr. Huntington. Still no reason to get agitated. Says the guy's burst in my room. If you aim the pistol directly at your interlocutor, gesture for them to leave. They exchange meaningful looks. Dr. Huntington, 
Men make step step towards you, but you are ready, and their hesitation is giving you enough time to bound towards the door and down the stairs. Yeah, no. You leave the building to run along the pavement. So much time to think. You decide to. You decide to the closest familiar place. Come up calling from the university. In a few mo minutes, you reach the house. Start pounding, pounding insistently on the door. Your heart racing. Turn back to the street. So far, there is no sign of three men. But it's only a question of time before they catch up. The valet comes to the door. The valet won't let you in. So you start yelling the name of your colleague. After a few seconds, you see his face peer at the window. Clearly he's trying to explain the danger you're in about the men chasing you. To your horror, he does not even answer you. Just to his valet to call the police or get rid of this drunk himself. You move back over to the window to protest. As soon as you do, the valet closes and locks the door. Guess we're running again. You are enraged, but you have no time to protest or think of anything else. Men chasing you around the corner at any moment. You continue running. You're sprinting as fast as you can towards the nearest police station. However, the men have anticipated this move, and two of them are blocking the street ahead. You're just asking where the third man is. He blindsides you and you're knocked unconscious. Yeah, I don't trust these bastards. You wake up still groggy. You try to get up from the bed in which you find yourself, but suddenly feel painful throbbing in your head. Memories come flooding back. Douse Bejernik, the attack. Where the hell are you anyway? Slide out of a comfortable bed, find linen sheets, and look around the room. It too is spacious, pleasant, and in addition to the bed, there's a sitting area in a small bookcase. You are bewildered as if in a dream. This could be a guest house of a stately house. Guess better of a stately house. There are no windows, but at the end of the room is a heavy, ornate door. Approach the door and try and open it. The handle turns, but the door is locked. Call someone. Hello, is anyone there? Shout a few more times, scratch is getting louder. But no answer comes. Decide to give up with the door and explore the room instead. Before long, you've confirmed your initial impressions. Everything is fine, high quality. Better even than your home in London. Occasionally, you return to the door and try the handle in vain. For the swallow room. You scan all over, examining every inch of the walls, search through any openings or clues that might yield more information. You examine for a second time the furniture and the bookcase. You find nothing, however, save for the fact the room must be cleaned, tidied fairly frequently. You must have had many guests over a long period of time. Sudden noise makes you jump. The door bursts open. Or the, the door opens in silence, prepare for com confrontation. The man enters the room wearing only some sort, only a sort of monochrome kilt and a skull cap and a strange stone mask. He is carrying a tray of food. He immediately starts asking, asking questions, but ignores you completely. He puts down the tray and turns to leave. You go forward trying to stop him, but you're suddenly paralyzed by intense pain in your arm. You can only turn your head an inch or two, and enough to glimpse a hair-thin needle protruding from right so shoulder. Watching him leave, you notice another man by the door, dressed in the same bizarre manner. You can only watch them silently leave and close the door. After a few minutes, the paralysis weakens. Somewhat discombobulated, you pull out the needle and look at the tray, on which there are various tasty-looking plates. Several hours pass before anything else happens. The door opens, and this time it's a woman who enters. She is dressed identically to the man, bare chested, skirt, skull cap, and stone mask. That's as absurd as the clothing is, there's something scaredotal about it. It reminds you of pictures 
a Sumerian and Egyptian priests. You vaguely remember seeing somewhere. Again, you were dumbfounded by the whole affair. But this time, you know straight away you know, the man standing at the doorway. You watch as the woman places another abundant meal on the table, takes away the untouched previous one. You look at the food and inhale its aroma. The dishes are appetizing, clearly prepared with care. Your stomach grumbles. You haven't eaten for many hours. You do not trust the food to eat fasting. You throw yourself on the bed and start thinking. It's made difficult by the delicious smell of food drifting over from the tray. What strange manner and or torture could this possibly be? To be locked up in such luxurious conditions. You're trying to make sense of this perplexing situation, but your mind, or rather your stomach, keeps wandering back to the tray. You are famished, but you have to stay strong. You don't even know how long you'll be kept here. Do not eat. You get up and irritably flip the table tray. Tray and all its contents on the floor. You return to the bed. Constant elimination of the room gives you no clues as to the passage of time or whether it's day or night. After only a few hours, you fall asleep. You wake up with a ravenous hunger and stomach cramps, still entirely unaware of how much time has elapsed. You know the room has been tidied up and the tray of food has been replaced with another. You need to eat. This time, the last of your concerns is poisoned. You attack this food in your tray, chugging your fervor. Even if they had to replace the tray, you would have probably eaten the food you had knocked onto the floor. Many days have passed, even though you have no way of knowing exactly how many. If this absurd imprisonment is to continue much longer, you are quite sure that you will lose your mind. Once again, you are lying in bed, thinking after having been woken up. You get up to do some exercise, and as you are doing the last push-up, you raise your head to see something very unusual and unexpected. The door is ajar. I feel like it's a trap. At least we've got some experience points if we need to invest. You approach the door slowly. You're listening out for even the slightest noise. But there is only silence. You try to peer beyond the small gap between the door and the frame, but it's too narrow. You stop to think for a moment. Extreme caution. You open the door very slowly and silently, inch by inch. In the surrounding silence, every small creak seems to you a deafening screech. Having opened a few inches, you peer out. Seeing an empty corridor, you leave the room immediately. You find yourself in a corridor lined with several doors, all identical to that which you came. There's wallpaper covering the walls, making it impossible to understand what what type of building it is. There's nothing else. Only a corridor with six doors. It's open the farthest. You can think a few steps along the corridor, try the farthest door from yours. You grab the handle, but it's locked. You try a little force, even though you're quite sure that it's locked. Let's see if we can hear something. You put your ear to the door and concentrate on trying to pick up the slightest noise. You think you can hear breathing, but you decide that it could just be a trick of the mind or the pressure caused by having your ear pressed against the door. You leave the door and try another. Try another door, stem in the center of the corridor. It is closed, you try the one opposite. The handle turns. Warily, you push the door and enter the room. Find yourself in a large room with a huge library, leather armchairs and some to its furnishings. It looks like a lounge of any of the more prestigious gentlemen clubs in London. Men and women are sitting quietly around conversing. Although they are dressed in the same as our clothes, with which you are now familiar, grinning stone masks, kilts, and that bizarre little skull cap, Posture and overall bearing seems to identify them as nobility. 
on their wrist. They all have the same tattoo. Shape reminiscent of an eye. The tattoo is pretty unusual. It reminds you of the eye symbol you saw in that book about ancient Egyptians in London. What connection could that be? The atmosphere is extremely surreal. They are acting as if you're not even there. Finally, someone notices you. Dr. Huntington, finally, de- finally you have decided to join us. Switch him up by the mask, and he makes Jeffrey sit in a nearby armchair. Everyone present turns to look at you through the dark holes in their masks. On the table in front of you is a glass of red wine, which you are sure is of the finest quality. You do not dare to take it, but whether, rather listen carefully to the masked man who's speaking to you. Dr. Huntington, let us not get off on the wrong foot. I can imagine that you have many questions. Then I assure you, if you make the right choices, there will be a time when you are given all the answers you seek, and many that, as yet, you do not. You can feel all the people in the room staring at you, analyzing you. After spending days in a luxurious prison, you know that you're unlikely to gain anything with a direct attack. Yet there's something familiar about the voice. Though it's muffled, it's tone and phrase reminds you of one you've heard before. There's a strange accent, but the distortion makes it difficult to identify. But the height and body size match well. Could this man who is dressing you actually be Mayor? Ooh, I don't trust Mayor. So do we insist or wait? I have no answers now, then. Dr. Huntington, I have no fear you have answers. And to have them, you must make choices. Hopefully, the right ones. We do, after all, have at least one objective in common. We are, let's say, a very exclusive club. Our members come from the elite of many different specialities to different parts of the world. We include nobility, entrepreneurs, and military men. Even some like you, from the world of science. We have been active as a group for a very long time. Our work goes back countless generations. We have always had a significant influence on all major historical events. And now we are close to achieving what could be termed a new level of influence. So you are listening to his words. You wish it was possible to write them off so it's a madman. But you cannot. In fact, they just seem to describe a world very close to what which you have been imagining. Certain resources and unique ca- capabilities allow access to our group. Capabilities such as your own, Dr. Huntington. You are an intelligent man. I do not imagine that I need to tell you just how many advantages there are for you once you decide to join us. I will not join you. Because there's one big disadvantage, and that is ethics. This is clearly unethical. So we're not going to join them, ever. For this reason, we've taken care not to let your name become public knowledge. We do not allow publicity for our members. Check the proposal off the bat, or hold your tongue. I think we need to wait. This time, get as much information as we can before we say, screw you. We are not here to force you, Dr. Huntington, and we will give you some time to consider it. We will see you here tomorrow. In the meantime, enjoy our hospitality. As he speaks, he's getting up. Several other members of the club are already moving towards the door, the back of the room, and he cues behind them. Start in the direction two, but he waits quickly blocked by another masked man. He's silently pointing at the door behind you, the one from which you came, with a particularly muscular arm. Now I'm not going to provoke him. You start moving back towards the door to the corridor. Turning to look at the last to leave the room, the heavy set man who pointed you back into your room gives Brighton orders not to kill you. But it's probably better not to risk it. 
might even have some of those damn paralyzing needles. Entering the corridor, you find the door of your room open and going inside. Guys, why don't we find there? There's a wondrous five course feast of fine food, including quail and other such dishes. Some that you don't even recognize. You have just crossed the threshold when the robot goes behind you. You need not check to know that it is locked again. You wake it from tormented sleep full of terrible nightmares which you can barely remember. You are left with distressing intimations of dark and ominous forms. But any sort of concrete image fades away immediately away. When you calm down a little, you see that the door to the corridor is wide open. You can see into the corridor, and even part of the door which you know leads to the club. You can presume the door is also unlocked. Let's remain. You still ignore the members of this exclusive club. You are quite happy to avoid further predications, attempts at indoctrination. You stay in the room, devour the breakfast that's waiting for you there, and then try to reason through all the events that occurred to you thus far. As is by now your routine, to lie down in your bed for eating, soon you are asleep. Upon awakening, you see the doors open once, once again open. This time, however, there is no meal. Time goes on, you go on ignoring the open door. Many hours have passed. Perhaps even a whole day. Your stomach starts grumbling. Since you decided to stay in your room, no more food has been brought to you. Fine. We'll go indulge them. Enter the large room, your nostrils immediately hit with a powerful aroma of roast meat. Can you look to see it there on the tables as if waiting for you? Trying to remain calm. You sent episodes to a healthy sized portion. Welcome back, Dr. Huntington. In the room, there are fewer people. Although you cannot be certain given the consumption of the mask, do you presume the man who is speaking to you is the same as the previous occasion? As you can see now, the right choices bring reward. The room continues to fill, and the man watches you to so you eat your plate of food. When you finish, he gets up to go and to the, join the conversation of a group of other members a little way off. The one approach is entirely concerned with their nudity. Just during she shows you the room, apparently inviting you to enjoy its many pleasures. Then she goes out to join a group of people playing cards at a low table. Um, no, leave. You decide to return to your room. That you are unwilling to take part in this perverse pantomime. No one stops you or calls you after you go. Back in your room, you sit in the chair to mull things over. You do not notice falling asleep. The door of your room is still open. But this time, there is no food on the table. You have probably only been dozing for a few minutes. Time goes on, and you go on ignoring the open door. Many hours have passed, even a whole day. Your stomach starts grumbling. Why is it like a repeat? Yeah, this is like... Okay. Yeah, it's like the same. So, uh, I'm not gonna reread this. <laughs> so we have to participate. You decide to sink into the Congreal plush when arm chubs over the various goings on. If not for the unclosed torsos and the unsettling masks, the situation in this room could be absolutely normal, almost rather banal. Some people engage in small talk with others, while others help themselves to the buffet bar or smoke their pipes. You listen to some of the conversations in English nearby, but you're instantly bored stiff by the, the vacuity indigenous of the discussions. Typical of any pub or gentleman's club in London. Indeed, the only difference 
between this and Gentleman's Club, instead of the shocking state of undress, of course, is the presence of ladies. You cannot help but see it all as a pantomime, some kind of play, but you try to stay alert for clues nonetheless. In the end, you fall asleep, only to be woken sometime later by the sound of a bell. The sound of the bell, all the members leave the room. Again, you are surprised. But then, after a few moments, the heavy built member of the club reappears and again points to the door. Evidently, you are not allowed to be in the room alone. You go back to your room. Days pass thus. Each time the, your door opens, the room is available to you, but only when occupied by members of the club. You visit every time. You are welcomed and greeted, but no one speaks to you directly. You have been to the room of this club several times now, with the implicit understanding that if you stop going, you'll stop receiving food. You cannot fathom the attention of these strange people, at least not until you see a series of newspaper article clippings to obviously intentionally place the entrance of the hall. They are all articles about accidents involving the sudden random disappearance of famous people, overturned carriages, fatal beings, beatings by thugs, and arson attacks. The dates and origins of the newspapers from which they have been taken differ widely. Studying them carefully, you almost want to smile. The message, the threat they apply is clear, crystal clear. Well, Dr. Huntington, what do you think of our club? At this point, it's clear only option is trying to play along. Cautious. Failed achievement, but oh well. We're pleased to hear that, Dr. Huntington. We knew you would come around to reason sooner or later. All conversations would suddenly fall silent. As the master turns towards you, you pretend to not, not to have noticed. I suggest you go to your room and get some rest, Dr. Huntington. Tomorrow you'll awaken to your new life. Then you may begin to receive many of the questions you so desire. For the upteenth time, you watch as the members of the club slowly leave the room, followed by your interlocutor. This time, you're left entirely alone. Even the muscular guard, muscular guard is left with the others. Following the advice you've just been given, you head back into your room. Still suspicious. Your dreams are chaotic and fragmented. You wake up slightly dizzy and tense. On the table, there appears to be a folded piece of paper, and on the chair, there are clothes which you awoke here the first time. At your desk, you take a look at the sheet of paper. It contains instructions to tell you when now to contact the cold. If the date mentioned in the text is near, calculate that you have spent nearly three weeks in this prison. Fold the paper and go out into the hallway. Try the door of the club at this time it's locked. You try another, but it is also locked. Strange. Let's try one more door. Suddenly the door opens, you're immediately struck by natural light, fresh air. You stumble out, drunk for a few moments, on fresh air and liberty. You find yourself in a small, little, sordid alleyway. Coming out onto a main road, you see something would lift your spirits even further. Through a light in the fog, you see an unmistakable profile. The clock tower of Big Ben. All this time thinking that you were in a club in Delft with a very London atmosphere. You were in fact in London all along. Go to your house. Spoil the streets a little. You feel it's desire to walk a little. To reestablish contact with reality. Your captivity of the last few weeks makes everything around you seem hollow and artificial. What has happened to reality? Now you are aware that the world around you hides more secrets than you could have imagined. Soon you find yourself wondering without purpose nor destination. You feel eyes watching you constantly. At first exhilarating moments, the city to you now seems to you now alien and impressive. For you overcome his screaming sense of paranoia, you call a handsome and go home. Well, 
I think that's a good place to leave it off for today, guys. We were imprisoned. And a lot happened in this session. But wow. I really, really into this game. The story's so good. Anyway, if you enjoyed this as much as I have, and want to see more, make sure to like and subscribe. Hit that bell button. And I will see you next time.